guys a brief kind of overview a brief overview of the cotton research and promotion program. Hopefully this is a, a good reminder. Hopefully many of you on the call are familiar with what we do at the research and promotion program. But if not, um, that's kind of what I hope to give you a little bit of information there. Um, so we essentially have three arms of the research and promotion program, um, or the checkoff program, if you will, um, for cotton. So at the cotton board, um, where I work, uh, we collect the per bale assessment. So we collect assessments on all bales of upland cotton that are ginned in the United States. And then we also collect an assessment on the cotton content of goods that are imported into the United States. Um, so the cotton board, we collect those assessments. We administer the program. So that means we contract with Cotton Incorporated to actually carry out the program. And then we do communication with stakeholders. So meetings like this with growers, industry partners, presentations at meetings, et cetera. Get out there with you guys and make sure that you guys know what we are doing um, with your assessment dollars on your behalf. Then Cotton Incorporated, like I mentioned, they actually carry out the program. So they're conducting on farm, in lab, in mill research. They're promoting cotton to consumers. They're the ones that we say are actually creating that demand and profitability for your cotton that you grow. And then at the Research and Promotion Program, we do have oversight and governance through the USDA. So all messaging, um, all research figures that we put out there um, go through you know, a vetting and an approval process with the USDA. So like I mentioned, the two assessments that we collect are that per bale assessment on all upland cotton ginned in the United States and then the cotton content of imported goods in the United States. Um, we, every couple of years, you know, we try to update these percentages in our presentations, but for a while now, producer, in, producer assessments have been a little over half. So about 54% of the assessments we collect are from you guys from those per bale assessments and about 46% are from importers. What's really exciting about having both of these groups of assessments is that you guys as producers have a partner in the program. So these importers are brands, manufacturers, um, people that are using and selling your cotton to the public. So it really gives you a partner. It really gives you somebody who's invested in the program um, that wants to sell the product that you produce. So it's a really exciting um, partnership, I think, um, that we have importers and producers both paying into the program. With the fabulous compliance and financial department at the Cotton Board, um, we're very proud of our 99, well, over 99% compliance rate. Um, so it's really, that allows us to fund Cotton Incorporated at such a high level every single year. Every August, our two boards, the Cotton Board and Cotton Incorporated boards meet to discuss um, key strategy and priority areas for the upcoming year, as well as set the budget for their uh, research and promotion efforts. In, in 2022, we're really excited to have passed um, a budget of $82 million for Cotton Incorporated. Um, I'm sure it's no surprise to anybody on the phone that the last two years um, have been challenging um, social climates on farm climates. And we have um, been decreasing the budget over the last two years. But for the first time, um, we are excited to have an increase of the budget from 2021. Um, so this is still a high level that we're able to fund Cotton Incorporated at. And again, an increase from 2021 is really exciting. Thanks to our compliance department for having such a high uh, collections rate. So what we're here to talk about this morning is the state support research program. So through all of the producer assessments that we collect, um, seven and a half percent of those assessments are specifically allocated for the state support program. These funds are then distributed throughout the states based on their production. Um, and these funds are for each state to determine how to use for research projects that are specific to them in that state, in that area, so maybe a specific threat or a specific issue or an emerging issue that you guys have in Texas, specifically, you know, on this call, we're going to talk about some stuff that's specific to Texas and to East, Central and South Texas. The Texas State Support Committee gets to determine how to use those funds in something that's related to you guys specifically on farm in Texas. 
Um, each um, Texas state's each state support committee is made up of committee members, cotton board, cotton incorporated board members, researchers in that state, certified producer organizations in that state. And a lot of times these um, researchers, growers, committee members get together each year. Some projects are funded continually, some are new projects, but that's something that you guys as a committee and as a state get to determine how to spend those funds. And then, of course, all of the projects in the committee um, is managed by a Cotton Incorporated staff member. And we're going to hear from um, Galen Morgan on these projects here in just a second. I do want to show you this list of our uh, Texas State Support Committee members. Um, everybody here listed is a grower. Um, as I mentioned, everyone on our committee um, has a voice in these, in these funds. These are all of the Cotton Board and Cotton Incorporated board members um, that we have that are giving you guys a voice um, on, on both boards. So you can see we have growers from every single region of Texas. So we have great representation. They're out there representing you guys and your interest. Um, so it's really exciting to have such a, such a wide variety of locations and expertise that is brought um, to our state support committee. And with that, I am gonna turn it over to Galen Morgan, who is um, our Cotton Incorporated um, liaison for Texas. Um, so at this time, Galen, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Shelly. I mean, thank you, Christy, sorry. Um, I was trying to change my screen here. Can you see that, Christy? I can, that looks great. All right. Thank you, Christy, for that, for that overview. And, you know, it's good to see so many people, you know, on this, this call this morning. I see a lot of, you know, the IPM agents and I uh, saw Josh McGinney and some of the others uh, research and extension folks that are also participating in this, this call. So with that being said, as we go through some of this, uh, the presentations, I've taken quite a few slides from many of the individuals that are on this call. So I don't pretend to be the expert about this. This is just kind of the cleft notes of some of the, the many projects that the Texas State Support Committee is, is funding. Uh, there's a lot more uh, projects that are ongoing and a lot of proposals that are received every year that that the state support committee has to go through. And I'd just like to say before we get into some of the details is that I I oversee or am the liaison for for a couple of other states and I commend the Texas State Support Committee for their level of organization uh, and their commitment to this and identifying where these where the priorities are and, and where these funds should go. I'd like to also recognize Aaron Nelson with the Texas Cotton Producer, Texas Cotton Generous Association, who helps vastly with organizing you know, the July meeting and also the December meeting. He and I work closely to try to, to make things um, flow as, as smoothly as possible. So a shout out to Aaron on that one. So just an overview of a few of the things that, that go on, the Texas State Support Committee and funding for 2022 and those projects and, and those funds have already been allocated was right at $1.2 million. So you guys, the state of Texas has obviously more money than any of the other states. And again, Shelly or Christy showed you the long list of Texas State Support Committee members and each of those members do have input you know, into the, to where that funding goes. So annually, there's about 60 projects that are funded, um, all with Texas scientists, either with Texas A&M, Texas Tech, uh, USDA, and then sometimes some of the smaller universities. And then typically there's around 80 proposals that are submitted every year. So the funding for these projects are annual. Um, some of the projects that, that go on for multiple years um, they are looked at annually and the state support committee makes a decision as to whether that the fund should continue to go toward those projects. Again, this is a, you know, very, I think, diligent and efficient process that, that we go through. Um, when we meet in July, usually it's about anywhere from two to four hours going through these proposals and, and identifying which one should be funded for the following year. 
So I'm going to kind of get into just some overview of some of the, the major projects that are, that are being funded. And as we get to the end, you know, if there's some things that, that you all are interested in seeing that, you, that I didn't cover, be sure and ask those questions. Uh, maybe that research is going on and I just didn't cover this you know, short presentation. And if it's not being done, then uh, you know, we can reach out to those scientists across the state that may you know, be conducting that sort of research and encourage them to submit proposals uh, for uh, 2023. So I just wanted to mention first, uh, there are numerous uh, individuals across the state of Texas that, um, that look at variety evaluations. Josh McGinney's on the line and does a tremendous amount uh, of that work in that coastal bend and also working with Danielle down in the, the valley as well, looking at both small plot and on-farm large plot variety trials. And I think it, it's very important. Uh, obviously, this variety trial data is key to one of the most important management decisions the growers make each year. And if you look at Josh's data, uh, and this is across, you know, other parts of the state as well. And I should have mentioned Ben McKay up at college, uh, Ben McKnight up at College Station uh, also conducts a, a lot of trials, um, on-farm variety trials as well. But any given year, usually within those trials, those on-farm variety trials where companies provide the entries for those, uh, it's very typical to see a 10 to 25 percent yield difference and gross income difference between the best performing and the worst performing varieties uh, within those trials. Um, so with that being said, that obviously, obviously could have a huge difference on, you know, the grower profitability on, on any of those given years. And then, of course, there's various uh, breeder trials that are conducted by, by Wayne Smith and Steve Haig, such as the, oh, the uniform variety trials or official variety trials. And if you look at the combination of what Ben McKnight and Josh do, they're well over generally 30 plus locations from the Rio Grande Valley all the way up to the Northern Blacklands where they're conducting these on-farm, which we call the replicated agronomic cotton evaluation or race trials. That information is available uh, at cotton.tamu.edu. And usually Josh and, and Ben get that published somewhere you know, early to, to mid-December. Just want to touch a little bit on, on cotton disease management. Uh, Tom Isaac Eat has, has been at uh, with the Extension Service for a long time and does a tremendous job both in outreach programming, but also just keeping an eye on, you know, unique situations where diseases may be popping up, whether it's some of these viruses that have um, been identified in the past or the picture of here is bacterial blight, which definitely can be a problem at times. Um, in that coastal bend and, and throughout, you know, eastern Texas. So Tom does a really great job. I think all of you know him. He's been funded uh, regularly from the state support committee and is, is well recognized for his, his accomplishments. And one of those big accomplishments, of course, was um, this was funded by the Texas State Support Committee over numerous years, uh, was the identification of the uh, flu triophile or top guard uh, for management of cotton root rot in Texas. So again, this is probably one of the highlights of, of the things that State Support Committee has funded and has been extremely successful and, and brought a lot of value to the growers across the state of Texas. Is the identification of flu triophile or top guard for managing cotton root rot. And that research has, has kind of wound down. Um, it was taken over, you know, the companies have taken it over and but again, the identification of that and the honing in of rates, application methods, and all those things were supported through the Texas State Support Committee. Just touching a little bit on, you know, some projects that are funded, you know, statewide. Uh, nematodes are something that are problematic throughout the state. They're probably much bigger of an issue than we really realize at this point in time. The reniform nematode in particular can, um, thrives in, you know, heavy clay soils uh, all the way to some of the lighter textured soils. Uh, probably a much wider problem than, than many of us actually realize. And some of the research was started by um, Reagan Nolan out at San Angelo, but he has, he's leading an effort across the state looking at the impact of, you know, both infurrow treatments, um, 
and also these new resistant varieties that are resistant to the reniform nematode that's both available from both phytogen and also delta pine at this point in time. So I just want to, you know, these are some of the kind of statewide efforts that are going on where a project is led by one individual, in this case, Reagan's in San Angelo, but he's leading it with locations across, you know, numerous parts of the state. Just an example from one of Reagan's trials, this happens to be in San Angelo, but the exact same studies were conducted in, um, in, on that upper Gulf Coast as well. But just looking at the impact of what nematodes can do and some of the value that these resistant varieties have with those center four rows you're seeing here are susceptible varieties and these outer rows are resistant varieties. So these are new, um, literally they were new the past year or two and uh, they seem to definitely have the yield potential both under nematode pressure, but also when there's not nematode pressure. And this just kind of shows some of those results, uh, the spotogen 443 and 332 there in the bottom are resistant varieties in that delta pine uh, 2143. So you can see the top yielding varieties there. In this case, where there was, uh, in the, where there was nematode pressure, those varieties uh, top those trials. There's also a, a quite a bit of effort on weed management. Josh does a lot of weed management uh, from the project he's funded through. And then there's a statewide kind of weed group effort that focuses specifically on weed management. And Pete Dotre up at Lubbock leads that. Uh, but for, for South Texas, that includes Scott Nolte and Josh McGee. Um, and, you know, they, they basically look at you know, weed management as a whole, new products that may be coming out, new technologies, uh, herbicide tolerance, such as the HPPD uh, cotton that should come out in the very near future once there's some regulatory approvals made. A uh, huge focus has, has been on herbicide resistance and how to keep these uh, products on uh, and effective. Uh, and then, of course, as the Enlist and Extend Flex cotton has come into the, the market, um, they lead a tremendous effort in doing the required mandatory trainings. Just a little bit of research. Uh, this is slide happens to be from Pete Dotre, but this effort was led by Dr. Muthu up at Texas A&M um, in College Station, looking at the impact of seed longevity um, of Palmer amaranth or pigweed. Uh, and how viable that is. So you can see there was location in College Station, Corpus Christi, and then Lubbock. So this is a summary across those locations. So, you know, the positive thing here is big of a, a pain and as difficult as Palmer amaranth can be to manage and the amount of resistance, herbicide resistance that's out there. Uh, looking at these results, basically within about 12 months, we see that most of that Palmer amaranth seed is actually uh, decomposing and not becoming viable seed. So, you know, this is an important just kind of realizing we take care of those uh, escapes um, late season, prevent those from going to seed. We have a really good chance of, of helping to manage and prevent, you know, major populations and development of herbicide resistant Palmer amaranth moving forward. And again, I know Josh is on the line. If there are any specifics here, uh, you have questions over. Another slide that I stole from Josh in the presentation he gave at the State Support Committee, just looking at false ragweed or Parthenium ragweed, which is a challenge obviously down in that uh, coastal bend area and down into the valley, uh, but just looking at the use of Reviton uh, from Helm Agro and its efficacy in, in uh, this management of false ragweed. And I know Josh has a lot of trials looking at this management of this weed, if you have any specific questions, and um, I'm sure Josh can field those. Kind of moving on to the insect management, um, Dr. David Kearns up in College Station, he's an extension entomologist, also IPM coordinator. Uh, he works very closely with the IPM agents across the, the state, uh, looking at, in this case, the insect management uh, for Texas cotton and specifically some of the BT resistance. And these are some slides that I took from Dr. Kearns' presentation, but just looking at the, um, the development of resistance to the BT traits uh, over time, 
and you can see the with that cry one AC and cry two AB two, which are the the Bogard one and Bogard two. Uh, you can see the development of uh, resistance there, um, and then you can see the cry one F, where basically they quit conducting those because there was such a high level of cry one F. So, and you can see the testing locations um, working with. Danielle down in the valley and, and Stephen and Kate as you move up, up the coast and some of those collection sites. So the positive thing here is that the VIP 3A, at least at this point, uh, continues to hold. And the VIP 3A is in your Wide Strike 3 and your Bogard 3 technology. So the, on the positive note, uh, we do have still good um, control of the, the bow worm with the with the Bolgard 3 and the VIP, and excuse me, and the Wide Strike 3 technology. With that being said, and again, Danielle or Steven can speak up here, but we need to be very diligent, uh, just like we've developed resistance in these other BT traits, it could happen very quickly um, with the VIP 3 as well. Uh, and we need to be the best steward we can of this technology to keep it around as long as we can. Um, this is basically just showing the some of the traits and how the, you know, whether dominant or recessive traits uh, to actually hide this slide. So we'll kind of move on. And then looking at the some of the pyrethroid resistance. And again, I think David works closely with, with the IPM agents on collecting some of this, but just looking at you know, the percent damage fruit there in this graphic and seeing which of these insecticides are, you know, still effective in managing, uh, you know, the bulbar and which ones, um, you know, basically the pyrethroids uh, and which ones are resistance to the pyrethroids. So again, just so that you know which ones of these products, when you're looking to control the bulb worm, which one to focus on and, and which ones to avoid. Each of the IPM agents that I have listed here, and again, definitely a few of them are on the line. They have individual projects that they're working on that are usually very specific to their, their region. Um, like Danielle has some seeding rates and also some stalk destruction trials. Stephen does a, a vast array of both insect and also agronomic trials uh, with the funding that he gets and similar with, with Kate. Um, Tyler and, and David Drake, they all have their own kind of niche areas to answer specific questions uh, within their geography. But you guys know them all and you both are outreach programming and also uh, some of the applied research they're doing. And again, if you have specific questions, I'm sure these guys and ladies would be glad to, to answer those. You know, as we're, I put this in here because this is again, some of the, uh, former research that was funded through the Texas State Support Committee and knowing, you know, what input, input prices are right now, that being nitrogen very, very expensive. Just want to kind of reflect on some of the research that was funded and supported through the Texas State Support Committee on, you know, which nitrogen or what was the optimum nitrogen rates. And this is, um, I couldn't find the slides from when this was funded, it was basically the probably late, I don't know, 2008 through probably about 2014 or 15 when a lot of this research was being done. And I just couldn't find a slide. So I put up here a study that was funded from a Beltwide project, uh, but it matches very closely with what was found within Texas as well, uh, where they had in Texas 60 plus locations where they did nitrogen rate trials in cotton and well over 50% of those locations did not even respond to nitrogen. So in other words, if we applied rates of 50, 100, 150 pounds of N, over 50% of those locations did not even respond, uh, did not get a yield increase from the application of nitrogen. And a big part of that is obviously a lot of these soils have carryover nitrogen um, that could be utilized so in a year like this, when nitrogen rates are so high, I think we can definitely focus on some of those lower rates without hurting, you know, our yields. And slide up, up here is looking at that Beltwide study from 2009 and 10. And the, 
the graph is actually showing the nitrogen response rate for the responsive sites. So 50% of the sites, it would, would have been basically a flat line across there, no response to nitrogen at all. These are the responsive sites and you can see kind of that optimum rate uh, was wound up being about you know, 40 to 45 pounds of nitrogen per bale. And you can also see here, it really shows the, the negative impact that nitrogen can have uh, if you over apply nitrogen. And in addition to, to losing pounds of lint, you also, in many cases, you can, you can be very detrimental to your fiber quality as well. Uh, moving into stalk destruction, and again, some of this work is still going on with, with Danielle and, and uh, Josh McGinty as well. But these looking at chemical stalk destruction was highly funded through the Texas State Support Committee as the Enlist technology in particular was looking at being launched. Uh, some of the people on the phone, like uh, on the call here today, were very strong advocates for identifying alternative chemistries before the Enlist and ExtendFlex technology came out. And basically, this Duplisan or this DUP um, that Josh has listed here from this slide, this is basically uh, that's a product that was brought to market in large part due to support through the Texas State Support Committee. Now kind of moving to the breeding effort, there's a East and a West Texas breeding effort. Um, in the East Texas, there's Wayne Smith, Steve Haig, and, and Dave Stelly, and they work as a, a very, very good team. Uh, and I'll get into a bit more detail on some of the things they, they work on. And then they work very closely with Texas Tech University and the Fiber and Biopolymer Research Institute, or FBRI, uh, to make sure that the fiber quality components of their varieties that they're developing are also, you know, uh, matching up with where they need to be and, and hopefully improving uh, overall germplasm for, for higher quality characteristics. And that's one of the things that Wayne Smith specifically focuses on is, is extra long staple uh, cotton. This is a slide that I took from, from Dave Stelly's presentation, breeding and genetics, uh, just showing the ways that they're integrating, you know, some novel traits uh, and from both wild germplasm, but also genomic methods and getting those into some of the, the germplasm that can then bring new traits, such as the nematode tolerant traits and, and some of the other traits into the germplasm that the companies can pick up. Again, another slide from Dave Stelly, but I thought this was kind of an interesting one. We tend to focus on so much on the above ground biomass and above ground production systems, but Dave Stelly's doing some work uh, looking at the, the root morphology and how the, the root morphology and how maybe we could breed for, for better root systems on cotton, which is obviously gonna increase uh, nutrient uptake, uh, drought tolerance and those kinds of things. And then kind of along the molecular lines, uh, also, this is some uh, work that Lebo Sean is doing at Texas A&M, uh, looking at bringing in some of the bacterial blight resistance and also just understanding how bacterial blight uh, works within the cotton plant and how we can possibly do some genetic manipulation in order to increase our bacterial blight tolerance. Currently, there's very good bacterial blight resistance in most of the commercial varieties, but it's basically, it's, it's hanging on one gene at this point in time. Uh, so at any point in time, really, that resistance could break fairly quickly. So that's some of the things that, that Lebo's looking at. Um, I should mention also that Lori Henze's on the line too. She's a breeder with USDA and she worked closely with the folks with with Texas A&M AgriLife Research, um, you know, integrating numerous beneficial traits into uh, cotton and the germplasm developed from Texas. Kind of moving on to, you know, harvest situations. This is some work that Bobby Harden's doing there out of College Station, uh, where they're putting cameras on some of the, the forklifts like this or the loaders like this and trying to identify where the plastic tearing is happening on some of the, these round modules. 
because you're all very aware, well aware that you know these torn bales or torn round modules are, they think that's where most of the plastic contamination is coming from. So Bobby has an effort looking at, you know, where, it, where are those tears actually coming from? Are they coming, happening, you know, in the, the loading process, you know, with the module trucks, or are they happening on the, the gin yard or where are they exactly happening? So he's basically documenting that uh, with numerous camera systems kind of a, along that, that supply. And these are just a few pictures that he's identified as he has cameras in various places on, on these machines uh, and where some of those are happening. And there's an example over here where 4.3% of the modules had wrap damage uh, from you know, what he's found in his study so far. The, there's quite a bit of research that's definitely funded through at the state level that focuses on fiber research improvement. Uh, Brendan Kelly and uh, Nura Dean at Texas Tech University do a lot of this work. You know, it's things that the breeders and, uh, but many other people within, whether it's that affects fiber quality and the folks at, at Texas Tech and Fiber Biopolymer Research Institute have been really great uh, to work with to ensure that you know some of the agronomic practices or breeding or other things are making sure that we're optimizing our, our fiber quality. This is kind of a unique project that's again funded through some of the, the statewide money. It's being conducted at, at Texas Tech, uh, but looking at the use of some of the low quality or discount cotton, things like that, what could be some alternative uses for it. So this is a something that Nuradine's looking at creating basically a, a cellulosic gel uh, that could be some sort of you know, plastic type replacement. Obviously it's very biodegradable as well. So we think there's you know, a lot of potential on this. So just put this in here mainly, the Texas State Support Committee is not only funding very applied and trials that are gonna affect you guys this year and, and next year, some of those more pressing issues, they also have a really good vision looking forward about what could be done five and 10 years out to help secure um, cotton use and alternative uses for, for cotton. Kind of last, I just want to mention this, um, you know, a lot of the things that the Texas State Support Committee um, funds it may not, may not directly fund graduate students, although a lot of some of the projects do. I can nearly guarantee you every one of the projects have a graduate student working on it. So there's some money going to grad students to help train the next generation of, of cotton scientists, whether it's on the fiber side of things or the very applied side of things or the ag engineering side of things. So it's very important the funds are, are used for that and also for, for student workers and training student workers. Um, I had, when I was at Texas A&M, I had numerous uh, students that went back to the farm after being a student worker within in my program. And I know that's the case for, for many of the other scientists uh, working in cotton. And then kind of last, um, many of the projects that are funded through the state support committee may not specifically state an outreach effort, but a lot of the, the research that is getting out to the growers through field days, through social media, through newsletters and things like that are happening in large part in thanks to the Texas State Support Committee funds as well. And it's a very important component. Uh, you know, the information that the research you see here is, is done for the growers of the state of Texas. Um, and it's unbiased information on new and older products, you know, management strategies and cultural practices. You know, some of the reduced tillage systems, for example, it, it may, not be, may not be pushed by the private industry because there's not a lot of money to be made there, but the research that's being funded uh, through the research institutions help address some of those cultural and management strategy questions that growers may have. Obviously, you can get firsthand observations through field days. I know Josh and the IPM agents on here both conduct and participate in, in tons of field days every year. And then, of course, information is disseminated through 
disseminated through newsletters and, and web pages. And I just put probably the main one. I think Josh has one as well. And I know that Stephen has, you know, um, sends out a lot of information as well from his blog. Um, but here's the cotton.tamu.edu webpage, which is where kind of a, a lot of information is on cotton. The cotton cultivated uh, link there is at Cotton Incorporated and it includes some of the more beltwide or multi-state type efforts. But I just wanted to put those as two key references there. And with that, uh, Christy, I'll be happy to answer any questions. I think it's also, I didn't mention it earlier, but one of the things that we were hoping to get from this is also feedback. Uh, if there's something that, that you all think that should be done differently or research areas that need to be done, then uh, you know, please chime in verbally or put it in the chat and we'll try to answer those questions and would appreciate any suggestions you have. So, thank you, Christine. Thank you, Galen. Yeah, thank you, that was great. Hopefully this gives you guys um, kind of a preview into um, what, what we're working on on your behalf across the state, what these fabulous groups of researchers um, are working on for you. If you have any questions, feedback, please go ahead and unmute your microphone now. I am watching the chat box if you'd rather drop something in the chat. Um.